And I can only say this after four years. I can only say this after four years of having a lot of like no's to understand why I had all of them. And I don't know how else to rephrase that. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. Welcome to the Talking Shop Podcast, where I'm here to share stories, lessons, and experiences in sports performance and professional development. And I'm super excited for this episode where I'm sharing my own stories, lessons, and experiences. And more specifically, the four biggest lessons from four years of full-time coaching. My slides, I got six of them. One's an intro, one's an outro. And for the lessons themselves, I'm going to go through the lesson, a few anecdotes from each, the kind of silver lining, and then wrap it all up at the end. So the goal for this podcast from me to you or me for you is that you feel related. You learn some things that you can really only learn from experience and that there's a nugget or two that you can kind of take with you to help you kind of navigate these four biggest things that I myself have learned. So you are not alone. I'm excited to share the positive, the negative, the good, the bad, kind of everything in between. So I'm, I'm super excited for this one. Let's get into it. So first starting off super strong. The imposter syndrome is real. And first, let's just start with a little definition, or at least, you know, imposter syndrome sounds uh, sounds all good and dandy, right, in theory. But imposter, this like fakeness or dissonance, and I think that that happens between what you're saying is happening and what's actually happening slash the actions that you're taking. So the imposter syndrome is when you're you're saying these things and these things are happening because of your words, right? But on the back end, you're kind of not following through. So the 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 two stories that that I want to share is first, as a coach in my most recent role, I've been trying to sit down with my athletes one on one in my new job at Northwestern. Um, not a, a formal chat, but like, let's find a, you know, 15 minute chunk of time to sit down and talk. No real agenda beyond just, I want to learn more about you, where you've been, where you want to go, what I can do for you, what's worked well, what hasn't and kind of everything in between. Um, so formal, not formal, but it was interesting is believe it or not, student athletes are kind of busy, especially in Northwestern, right? That I wasn't able to get to all of these until like the back half or even like the end of this current fall. And not to kind of toot my own horn, but when I asked, you know, what can I do for you to help me help your story become real, help you, you know, tell a story that you want to tell at the end of this year, at the end of your three, four years, whatever it may be, training or not training related, I got some consistent feedback from the the athletes of not really much. We appreciate what you're doing. We know that you care and that you're invested because you're always at practice when you can be and the workouts are fresh and fun and and kind of all of this stuff. And of course, it like feels good the first time that I heard it, you know, like, I'm glad that they know I care. Hopefully I can like show that. Right. But then when it happened, like a few more athletes kind of in a row, it was like, oh, like I'm actually doing like a pretty good job, you know, and, and it's so hard because feedback is so scarce in our field. And I want to talk about that in, in three kind of uh, scenarios. So we have coaching athletes. You have the coach, you, and then you have kind of content as I'm not a content creator or an influencer, but I'm a coach who makes content. That's kind of how I describe it. But, you know, feedback is scarce when you're coaching and it's usually more negative kind of to correct, right? Where they're to coach, improve, hey, work on this. Hey, that was close-ish, but et cetera. You can't only coach the positive things that they're doing well, Right. Now, that's not to say that you never should, but the, the ratio, right, of positive to negative is definitely more kind of negative, right? And as a coach, there's not too many people like telling you a great job, you know, and, and I think it, it's hard in coaching where a majority of what you're doing is proving stuff didn't happen, right? Reducing the risk of injury. Yeah, there's improved performance, right? But I think we can all agree that like athletes with a low enough training age they kind of just have to train anyway. So you can't really hang your head on just getting results unless they're like crazy, crazy results that um, probably not many other coaches could have gotten, right? So it's proven that a lot, a lot of stuff didn't happen. And um, and as a, a coach who creates content, beyond posting and beyond the quantity of likes 
And the few random messages, which I, I do really appreciate, I screenshot most of them of someone saying, oh, hey, that podcast episode really clicked for me or that YouTube episode was great and so on and so forth. There's not much feedback, right? And and also as a coach, like, like my boss, ex-bosses, kind of those who have um, been above me, their job isn't only to be my cheerleader either, just how I'm not there to only be a cheerleader for my athletes. So I think feedback is is scarce. So it's hard to know for sure that there's that, not that gap of like what you're saying and what you're doing. Right. So it was interesting that everything that had to align for me to get that, that little bit of positive feedback. Right. And, and the second kind of story that I have from this is as I've consistently been posting content for, I guess, four years now, ever, well, actually six, ever since I interned at TC Boost back in summer of 2016, Eric Cressy inspired me to write uh, or start a blog and, and the rest is kind of history, but over a thousand posts on Instagram, this is going to be episode, um, 160 of TSP, the talking shop podcast, um, like 7,000 in Instagram followers and 2.5 on, on Twitter and 30 K on TikTok. a, of who do I think is doing really good stuff. Right. And the ones that came to mind were all late thirties, forties, fifties that have been doing this 10 plus years. So it's like, who am I to say that, that me at four and in my late twenties, I'm not going to tell my age specifically because I'm not telling any of my current athletes. I think it's kind of funny, you know, to say that I, I have this crazy new idea or my podcast is worth listening to or my thoughts are X, Y, Z. And I think it all comes back to how you frame it, right? Like these are my stories and experiences, which are real to me. And I think can provide some value to other people, right? I don't think my stuff is clickbaity, uh, but who am I to say that like, this is worthy of your time. So that's definitely something that, that I, I am super conscious of. Um, but again, and this is the silver lining, cut yourself some slack. Cause if you're doing all that you can do, then that's all that you can do. Right? So if you're doing everything, you can't close that gap behind what you're um, saying and what you're doing, then you're not an imposter, right? So I think um, that's the, the first biggest point that hopefully you can relate to. Second, there is value in everything. And it's been interesting to reflect back on this, you know, job search over the last kind of few years, more so of recent, that the stories and experiences that I reference in my interviews and stuff like that are some of the like smaller, not as significant kind of moments of my last kind of three, four years. And the one that I reference the most is, um, you know, coming from the private side, we don't coach that many athletes kind of at once that often, but talking about coaching a lot of athletes, well, I've coached a hundred plus athletes in the South side of Chicago that I met 10 minutes ago. And I had to I had to get by and quick. I had to bring the juice and I had to like lead a super effective warm up, right? And this was super last minute where it was me, Steve, and Tommy at TC Boost, you know, in the city. And Steve was like, So you, you got the warm up today? And I was like, Oh, uh, man, you know what, Steve? I'm, I'm going to have you take it because if the, if the athletes don't run well in there, it was like a football combine. If they don't run well, then, you know, then I don't want them to blame me. You know, me just, I don't know, trying to be funny. And he was like, you sure? And I just like thought about it. And I was like, you know, I'll do it. Why not? And th- that was this relatively insignificant thing that I referenced so much about, like, I can work with a lot of athletes or that was just one specific experience that I thought was challenging that I, I did a good job at. Right. And I've told this story here before, but this was many, many episodes ago, but I almost left TCU during my master's. I was, uh, I was there to do sports science in the sports science center. And my boss was a really big uh, cluster guy. Like that was his research thing, right? You know, do five reps, rack it for 10 seconds, do five more. How does that compare to 10 straight, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like a month in, I was in our like dungeon basement lab thing, just like reading research on bar speed and just like another study, another study. And I remember, you know, calling my parents, just saying like, I can't do this like, this sucks. And, and these thoughts of like, what am I going to tell them at TCU? What am I going to tell people when I go back home? And I'm just like there now, you know, cause I was 
at TCU, right? Like what, what had happened and changed. And, and I, I sent Steve an email and I specifically remember um, Steve being my, one of my old bosses, you know, just asking for his kind of two cents, right? Cause he was in the field. So he kind of gets it more than like a parent would. And he was like, the grass is always greener, you know, like stick it out, see what happens. And, you know, fast forward two weeks, I'm doing applied sports science with the baseball team. Fast forward two months, I'm doing, I'm traveling with the beach volleyball team that turns into my thesis. And the fact that I got my thesis published and going through that process is a huge, you know, kind of foundational moment of my kind of like sports science or data fasc- fascination or one of my kind of unique kind of spins on sports performance and stuff. So, so just crazy to think back that like <laughs> how different it all would have been if I had left TCU. Um, but I've, I have a few, you know, personal rabbit holes that I've dove in down a recent dove down a recent that I want to share kind of how it's all come back to kind of what I do and video editing. That was kind of during COVID and quarantine. I just really liked those mini mentories. I guess that's what they call them. Those like 10 to 20 minute kind of documentaries on a person or a specific thing that happened that like look very good because they're well-made, but they're very personal as well. Right. Cause it's not some big production. It's just about like, like a, a, a CrossFitter, right. Cause their brands are bigger because they don't make as much money or uh, like dry line does some pretty good mini mentories and stuff. And then I like learned how to make and edit my own videos. And then my boss was talking to the president of Tenity Motion about, oh, Matt makes podcasts, he makes videos and he's kind of creative. And then and then the the president asked me if I want to make marketing videos for him and then I'm getting flown across the country. And then people that I made these videos for are like good people in my network now, right? So something completely unrelated to coaching itself came back and is still back and adding value to to my life right and one of those things directly led me to a job opportunity and many are just really good really good friends kind of like i said so fantasy football and tiktok i would say all three things help me connect and chat with my athletes more than anyone kind of might think at first and that sounds super insignificant and although like i'm super into training and what i do and i enjoy and i want to teach and I'd like can word vomit all of this training stuff and explain my thought process and my why is like, so my old like middle school, high school boys just want to like talk about fantasy football. Right. And my first year doing it was last year. And I had so much more to talk about and my athletes would come running in and they'd like have all these things that they want to talk to me about. Cause I would follow the, I'd start following the NFL and I knew how many points guys were scoring and stuff like that. And TikTok, you know, selfishly that started to make my own content, but just to be in on the trends and the songs and stuff like that. Like, I think it just helps me kind of speak my athlete's language. So there's value in everything, even if you might not kind of see that up front or kind of in the moment. Number three, people will take you the furthest. And there's a quote that I've said that I've spun and I'll repeat of, you know, people always say it's about who you know. And this was the biggest kind of roadblock or issue that I ran into when I was looking for jobs and networking, kind of doing all of these things was these people were like, oh, wow, it's actually a pretty crazy tree that's kind of led you from the beginning of your journey to that person, to that person, et cetera, et cetera, down all the way to me. Like, you must be a decent dude if like you've gotten that many like yeses and referrals, but I can't speak to you as a professional, right? I can only speak about you as a person. So for me to say that I know the director of performance at an MLB team, right? Is a lot different than him saying, oh, I know Matt, he's my guy. He's legit. He's really good at what he does. You know, like he's innovative. We have really good phone calls, right? So me saying I know him versus him saying he knows me is two completely different things, right? So I think it's so important to keep in mind, how can you become a non-stranger or how can you become in this professional context, right? Of networking, how do you become more than just a person of them, but also a professional, but then also to show that you're real as well, you know, like how many, and and this is actually a a story I didn't plan on talking about, but I, I think it's valuable of, it was hard when I was networking and I was young and in my early career of, I feel like I was just asking for stuff from people. And 
when you're early, like, yeah, that's really kind of all you can bring is just like a good convo. You can come prepared. You can show that you value their time by having good questions and making a good convo and stuff. But then, you know, I talked to someone two months would go by, I text them to hop on the phone. Three months would go by, I text them to hop on the phone. And it's like, I only text them when I need stuff, right? Like when's the last time I texted them about just whatever, whether it's a holiday or whether it's they told me that they were having surgery in a few months or whatever it may be. So I think it's a combination of showing that you are a professional in any way that you can. I think that there's a lot of value in meeting someone in real life. You know, Kyle Davies has been on the podcast a few times, a good buddy. He's one of the people that I made a video for, for Tony Motion, right? And I had him actually on my podcast because I was trying to do one a week and I had a few phone calls with him about the video, but I was going out to to fly and, and film the video, but we did the podcast before and I spent a whole day with him and I'm like, oh my gosh, dude, if I did this podcast now after hanging out with him for hanging out with him for a whole day, I feel like I know him so much more and like, it was just so much better just getting to know him that way versus just phone calls. So I think, how can you become a professional or show them that you're a professional, whether it's remote or in person, or even if it's just a few hours at a time, right? You can't work for everyone, obviously. But then how do you show that you value them more than just as a professional, right? Them as a person, you care about their personal life and what they got going on and talking to them about fantasy football, right? Like just random stuff to show that like, you're not just trying to like leech them in a professional context and meet in real life if you can. I think that that leapfrogs 10 phone calls, just one hour hanging out live. And people come back, uh, whether you know it or not, and not to like, be nice to everyone being like, Oh, like, I can't wait till, till like being nice to like little Johnny or not little Johnny. I use that for all, all my like anonymous old athlete names to be super nice to John, Jonathan, because I know that like good karma will come my way, but it's like just being a good person, be a good person. And at my, my current job at Northwestern at TC boost, my old job, we would use the football turf. We'd use the football turf for our NFL combine guys, right? On Fridays and then Wednesdays and Fridays to to do our sprints, do our positioning uh, specific drills, routes and stuff like that, just in deep turf, in cleats and kind of stuff like that. Because we only had thinner turf in the facility. And when I had got, gotten a call back by my interview about this job, my current boss said that he'd actually seen me in the facility before, right? Which I had zero idea. So it's like, you never know who's watching in a positive way. So like be a good dude to good people and like just be intentional, but also real about like being a professional, being a person and, and stuff like that, because you never know. And people do come back. You just never know when or how, uh, but if you're just being a good dude or a good gal, it'll work out. And last, Oh, I had to, I had to put it in there. I hate myself for this, that um, everything works out. And if I sat here and acted like I always was the most patient in the moment, or if I sat here and acted like I never had a negative reaction to something not going my way as a professional these last few years, I'd 100% be lying. And it's crazy to think back how grateful I am for this current job that I literally couldn't have drawn it up any, any differently if I tried all of the factors that make this job what it is and all the things that I've learned and all the doors that closed for me with other jobs and that all this happened now. I look back and I almost feel bad that like I had let things bother me so much or I wasn't as positive as I could have or should have been. And it's to give myself some grace, but it it does work out. And there's so many things like I, I already referenced the the TCU opportunity and this current job, but even as I had, you know, different interviews and opportunities along the way, I wouldn't get a job and I'd be like super bummed. And then six months later, I have another opportunity. It's like, Oh my gosh, I've learned so much in these past six months. Like, thank, thank God I didn't get that job because I, I didn't know, or I didn't have this experience. I, I didn't know those certain things in that six month gap that if I had gotten that job, then, well, there's no way I would have done it as well as this current opportunity because I had those six months to learn whatever it was. And then I wouldn't get that opportunity that I learned more in. And man, it does. So, so 
knowing that like, yeah, it sucks and things can bother you. Like, that's fair. You're, you're a human. I'm, I'm a human. You can have reactions, but like in the moment, can you just like take a step back and then just tell yourself, like, I know it will, I don't know when, but like everything will work out and this is how it was supposed to be. And I can only say this after four years, I can only say this after four years of having a lot of like no's to understand why I had all of them. And I don't know how else to rephrase that. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. Closing four points, four bullet points of kind of take homes. So number one, the imposter syndrome, how to combat that. There's no kind of better phrase that I've found to kind of summarize how to combat imposter syndrome than just be excellent, right? Like I can't make myself jump from four years to 10 years of experience, right? I can't control how many likes I'm getting, or I'm not going to inauthentically be clickbaity or whatever it may be, but I can just be excellent and really good at like everything I do and know that I did my homework. I did it the right way. I didn't cut corners and just like excellence and excellent just like came to mind. Um, if you ever have those thoughts of like, should I be here? Do I deserve to be here? Like, I hope no one calls me out and stuff. So just like be excellent. Number two, to bring to life that there is value in everything is be hesitant to say no. And there are so many things, like I said, that it would have been easy to say, no, I'm not going to do that warm up at that one random day a few summers ago, um, kind of in, in the city, or it would have been easy to say no to, oh, do you want to like make videos for, um, for 1080? And I actually told him, I was like, you know, I just make like videos in my basement, right? Like, it's just me messing around with like video editing techniques that I just like watched a t tutorial on 10 minutes before. And then I just want to see if I could do it myself. Right. Um, so if I, if I had like let the imposter syndrome win of like, oh, I can't make videos and I don't deserve to get paid for this. And this is me just in my basement. Right. But like, yes, I'll do it. See what happens, et cetera, et cetera. And like fast forward, so many positive things have come from just saying yes, even though I was hesitant um, at first to say yes, but be hesitant to say no not never say no, but like, if it's going to be a no, and you're, you're going to close a door on whatever it may be like, no, for sure that like, that is the right thing. So there's value in everything, whether it's directly related to your job or not, and be hesitant to say no, because you never know. Number three, four people will take you the furthest. It's not who knows you. It's not who you know, it's who knows you. And the take home point is become vouch worthy, right? So when someone says, oh, they're my guy or, oh, they're my gal, you have to hop on the phone with them. They're super legit. They're vouching for you, right? And they can vouch for you as a person. They can vouch for you as a professional, but do whatever you have to do where, whether it's being intentional about going and driving two hours each way, right? Four hours of gas, like that's not cheap about going and wanting to shake their hand and break bread with them. I don't know why I like that phrase, but break, bed, break bread with them hang out with them, show that you're a person, right? You value their time so much that you're willing to give up four hours of your time kind of doing so, right? Or four hours of driving or whether it's just, you know, I, I the, the voice reminders I use all the time on my phone, right? If someone tells me that they have a big event or whatever it may be, I'll, I'll do Siri. I'm like, remind me on if today's December 3rd, Hey, remind me January 3rd, to text XYZ about surgery that they just had or something like less uh, significant, right? If they said that they, they just closed on a, on a house somewhere, hey, Siri, in two weeks, remind me to text them about their house. Like those things go such a long way. And it's not to be inauthentic. It's just like being very intentional about um, being a person, being a professional. And how do you get more people to say that they know you? And last of everything works out, the take home point is to take a step back in the moment. And I know this now because I have this lesson, right, that I've learned, but like, let your reaction be what it is when things don't work out, you're allowed to feel what you feel, but then that can't dwell, you can't hang on to that and you can't act like that's the end of the world. So it's hard, but like, take a step back and be like, okay, like this didn't work out what do I have moving forwards? And it'll just click one day. So that's all I have for you. The talking shop podcast, my four lessons of the last four years. Hope you enjoyed.